Okay, thank you. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining, especially Steve Brightman, who, are, who is our guest reader tonight. Um, we're going to have a lot of fun. Tonight is our uh, sixth, sixth Mingle with the Flamingos. We are now halfway through a year of mingling. Um, we do this every month. It's the second Tuesday, so please join us again in the future. Um, we have tonight Steve Brightman. I have the honor of, of introducing him. Steve Brightman is an Ohio native poet and author who lives in Akron. He earned his MA in creative writing from Eastern Kentucky University and is the author of two books, The Circus of His Bones and The Wild Gospel of Careening and Other Sermons from the Rumble Strip, as well as eight chapbooks. A two-time Pushcart Prize nominee and the winner of the 2001 Ohio Writer Magazine Poem of the Year Award, Steve's work spans a wide range of publications and anthologies. So Steve, thank you so much for joining us. Take it away and let us know if you need anything along the way. All right. I don't think I'll need anything from anybody other than your half faked attention. Um, the first set of poems are, I'm going to read are from the Circus of His Bones. Um, for those of you who are not yet familiar um, with the book, it's written from the perspective of three characters, Adam, Eve, and the serpent. And uh, what I tried to do is uh, turn convention on, on its ear a little bit. Um, the serpent is less the tempter than um, the narrator. He's not a reliable narrator, but he um, lets us know that Adam has uh, that Adam has come into existence and announces uh, the birth of Adam through a series of five poems. Um, it's not so five separate births, um, not five separate physical births, so much as it is births that you kind of find yourself when you're on a trajectory in life, there are events in your life that happen that kind of re-alter your trajectory. And you don't always know it when those happen, but those I've started to consider births. And so what the serpent is doing is telling us um, when Adam's trajectory has been readjusted or realigned. Um, the serpent poems are short, but they are kind of daisy chained together. Um, I'm reading the their voices together, um, or their poems together, um, even though they're spread throughout the text. Um, when I say daisy chained, um, what I mean is that there's a line um, in one of the poems that's continued in the second poem. A line from the first poem is continued in the second poem. A separate line from the second poem is continued in the third poem. A line from the third poem into the fourth poem. And finally, on the fifth poem, um, a line is repeated in the first poem so that it goes in, in, in a circle. Anyhow. These are my serpent poems. Serpent announces the first birth of Adam. All good myths begin with a bird or a human far too curious or callous and sometimes mistaken by a distracted and careless manner of youth well before they realize the expense of free. Past, present, and future are all visible at once. Once upon a time, plus once upon a midnight dreary, plus once upon a dream, plus once upon a child. This is the adding machine where Adam was born. Serpent announces the second birth of Adam. Feathered things escape upon air faster than an eye blink. Forestry is good for cover, but only until nightfall. All good myths begin with a bird or a human, but darkness brings a different predator. Rugged foliage serves as his swaddling clothes. The scruff of his neck still has loose enough skin for carrying one clenched jaw from the Donner party. This is the food chain where Adam was born. Serpent announces the third birth of Adam. Every family tree is gigantic in the dark and his deceased are warriors still. They have dispatched themselves to fetch each daybreak to set it at his feet and never tire. At first he doesn't notice the ghosts in his periphery but he gradually reacquaints himself with faces and forgotten voices, cocks his head and steps nearer. They remind him of their ancient warmth. He barely takes note when he becomes one of them. Darkness brings a different predator. He starts to fetch daylight because they taught him to do so. This is the unassuming recruitment program where Adam was born. Serpent announces the fourth birth of Adam. Rainwater ends every one of its busy days soaking deep into the crooked dirt like ghosts in the periphery, never once forgetting the science behind the lift and the fall. 
all the while morning sits idly by smelling of earthworms and green grass and fruit that refuses to ripen. This is the condensation where Adam was born. Serpent announces the final birth of Adam. Past, present, and future are all visible at once. They align with the sun this time of year, scald their dislocation into ugly remnants upon the earth, soaking deep into the crooked dirt. Muscle and bone disentangle into a bouquet of days wilting around him. Past, present, and future are all visible at once. This is the triptych where Adam was born. And the next poem I'm gonna read is uh, Eve Sings to Their Offspring. It also um, is broken up throughout the text as a series of poems. But what I realized when I started um, reading this out as a part or in support of the of the book is that it really works well as one long piece. Um, the repetition of the beginning of each of the lines wasn't intentional that it was going to be um, uh, one continuable piece, um, but it certainly works that way. And uh, this is written uh, in the voice of Eve. Um, it's written less about her sin or her transgressions than it is uh, a love song or I guess a, a song of warning to her offspring. Eve sings to their offspring. Daughters and sons, the voice of your mother was the first voice you knew. Summer turning into fall is the beta version of your bones decaying, dressed for the occasion. Leaves are shiny on one side and the other side is built for thirst. Tomorrow may be the last full day without another headstone in your life. Take full advantage of easy breathing and your soft, comfortable middle, absent any hunger pains. Desire can rot you from the inside out and you will not see any bruising until well after it is too late. Daughters and sons, keep both eyes open for intersections. See them for what they are. Yellow lights are a caution only while you are driving. The sun is a yellow dwarf while you are sitting here breathing, and some dead folks are dead folks because someone couldn't see anything but red. Daughters and sons, the shelf life of magic decreases exponentially in sunlight. Do not fall in love with the iron and electricity in your, in your own blood. Science is reckless with the human heart. Math, too, has abandoned anything resembling organs or bones. Your spine can keep you upright only until you notice that it is doing so. Daughters and sons, the sun and the air are liars. Warm is as much a religion as an insurgency is, hastily scribbled on the nearest piece of anything which resembles a flat surface. This does not make anger a house of worship. Your body is a temple. Your neighbor's body is a temple too. Daughters and sons, say your hellos, goodbyes to each other. Remind yourselves that the desert is a desert for a reason. There's no need to walk through it just because it's there. Remind yourselves that the ocean is an ocean for a reason. Don't expect your friends to meet you every time you come up for air. Some days you have to swim for your lives and it's hard damn work remembering which body of blue is sky and which is water. Daughters and sons, don't confuse your medicine with your healing. Your skin doesn't have to be a small cacophony of demons. Expose yourself to natural light and remember that the mythology behind everything probably came from the voice of a man who was angry at the gods because his power was not as vast as he had hoped. Daughters and sons, do not be a friend of the dollar sign. Do not either make it an enemy. Know that it can be both a bludgeon and a scalpel, depending only upon who it is doing the wielding. Remember every maiden name on your mother's side. Remember how your father died. Daughters and sons, civilized life has made progress. We no longer believe that we lose fundamental pieces of our wretched souls simply for having our photograph taken. We are now owned by phones which unlock upon our eager garish faces. Yours has never been a world without electronics, without GPS, without camera lenses pointing at you and from you. Having never not known this captivity, excavation is gray, but necessary. You are the only ones who can dig yourselves out from underneath phones you will never know. Daughters and sons, regardless of your religion, sin at its core is an overwhelming failure to love the closest human to you. The closest skin to you is not the only skin in the game. Love the next one too, and the one after that. Daughters and sons, there are very few things in the world more troubling than extended silences. You should not let yourself become one. Your heart is, big as, a, your heart is as big as you need it to be. Remember how your skin zippers against the skin of your lover, closes dark space between you. 
turns it into almost light. Daughters and sons, cloud circles of crows will appear without notice sometimes. Show an applicable degree of awe, even though this black mass will never know who you are. The face of God is not and never will be kaleidoscope or cotton white beard. Daughters and sons, glass can be as sharp as a knife, but it was sand or stone once. Once upon a time is no way to be 20 one day and 50 the next. 1995 is a quarter century rear viewed already. Ocean has never once in that time stopped pulverizing the jagged shore. Thank you. Um, that was uh, the Eve uh, songs. Um, Adam is less, I suppose, a main character than a bumbling interloper. Um, the poems, although he is the main character of the poems, he's not the narrator of the poems. Uh, a lot of them are observant of, of things Adam has discovered. Adam instinctively loses concern for the axis of why. It started deep within his genetics in places that weren't named yet in places where ideas began at the most elemental level and in places where predators thrive on the dark and tentative irons in the blood. Night is coming earlier now and Adam un doesn't understand the axis of why. He only knows that he is hungry and you are close. Adam develops a tactile cruelty and a discerning eye for negative space. Wide enough to see all the beautiful teeth in the mouth of the Nile, wide enough to unleash color upon absence of color and then add another shade and another just to be safe. Wide enough to acknowledge saints were sinners who used to rely upon smoke to fill our young lungs when prayers sounded like forgeries upon our clumsy lips. And uh, this I think will be the last Adam poem. It's titled Adam Unbuilds a Box. Um, He identifies and attacks any and all nail holes. He unscrews and removes the hinged lid from box. He removes the sides of the box from the base. He unassembles the butt joints. He uncuts his boards. He unmeasures and unmarks his boards. He ignores his supplies. He returns wood into tree forms. He leaves the trees alone. He plants one more just to be safe. Adam remembers blue sky. And that's uh, all the poems from the Circus of His Bones that I'm reading tonight. Um, I, I thought I would have a little fun and go back in through my history, um, if you'll indulge me. These are a few poems from uh, my chapbook titled 13 Ways of Looking at Lou Reed. It is published by Night Ballet Press, or excuse me, by Crisis Chronicles Press. And um, it's less homage to Lou Reed than it is to Wallace Stevens, um, but Lou Reed is more of a, a, a character, the Blackbird, so to speak. Torch Song. Lights in the city will still burn white hot without Lou Reed. There will be torches and there will be gravel incandescents. Lights in the city will never know he is not there murmuring below. All of their vocals. The fuzz guitars do not sing hallelujah for Lou Reed. The singers are asleep in the garden and have forgotten their lines. All of their vocals have been overdubbed, walked upon, set into an infinite loop. Impossible to tell. Psychedelic rust, lunar aftermath, amplified, amplified, and after the 11th time, it becomes impossible to tell whether Lou Reed is saying Lisa says or Jesus, says, Jesus saves. Vending machine profiteers. Loud are the vending machine profiteers, one quarter, one quarter, one quarter, clank, clank, clank into the cracks in the armor, into the empty, into the Lou Reed skyline above a city he never saw. Loud are the boys and girls yelling in their nylon ripcord vocals. Loud are the raw and childish voices of the new silence. And I've got a couple poems uh, tonight from my first book, uh, The Wild Gospel of Careening and other sermons from the Rumble Strip. I was inclined to read one of these because it reminded me of Jeremy's work. Um, I'll read that one first. It's called Tupper Creek Road. Up along Tupper's Creek Road, basements smell like failure. Wood paneled ambitions peel away from the cement block walls in a musty yellowed fray. 
up along Tupper's Creek Road, folks don't go downstairs anymore. They sit at the dining room table and drink in the dark. Deputies like backyard dogs don't come when they're called up along Tupper's Creek Road. They know that punches are gonna be thrown. They know that shots are gonna be fired and that basements will all still be rotted in the morning. A um, couple more poems from this. Um, I'm looking for a specific poem titled The Lost White Horses and I can't find it. And of course, I thought I had it bookmarked. Oh, there it is, The Lost White Horses. My grandfather only once told me about the snow ponies. Only once told me how his father never drank on New Year's Eve, never drank at funerals, never drank with the other farmers in town. He would only drink one night a year. He would drink himself to sleep on the night of the first snowfall of every winter. He drank himself to sleep because it should have been easier to see the lost white horses through the blizzard with their eyes blacker than blackest black. Their eyes should have appeared twin lighthouses in negative as beacons reaching out for safety, yet they were not. It should have been easier to see the lost white horses with their eyes bolder than the boldest bold. Their eyes were twin steeples under horizontal sky, lost and blinking against the whitest night they'd ever know. And my final poem, I think tonight before, uh, before we break, uh, let's see if I can find it. Um, sorry about that. I thought I was more prepared than I am. That's on me 100%. Ah, the title poem, The Wild Gospel of Careening. Somewhere along the line, we have grown forgetful of the wild gospel of careening. Today, today it is time to careen. It is time to let loose the demons from their leashes and watch them as they leave uneven footprints in the pristine backyard snow. Run amongst them. Snarl if they get too close, too threatening. Run with your cold and wet nose in what is left of howling wind. Let the ice mat between the fine fur of your fingers and toes. You will hear train whistle blowing, bleeding with caution. It should sound foreign to you, not like a lonesome song. Thank you. It's all you, Jeremy. Excellent. Thank you so very much. That I, I really appreciate you reading. Um, round of applause for Steve. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Um, <clears throat> check out Circus of His Bones. I, let me re-link re that because it is it is a phenomenal book. Um, if we're gonna take a we're gonna take a five minute break, and then we're gonna come back and we're gonna do the open mic portion. So, if you haven't so far, I have Rich, Kevin, Blanche, Abby, Doc, Tom, and myself. If you are not on that list and would like to be, please let me know, and I'll add you. You guys have your your cats with you. I got my dragon hanging out with us. He's listening to the poems. <laughs> oh, that's cool. What, what, what kind of dragon is it? <laughs> a bearded dragon. It's a this one's a the citrus or um red dunner. Oh wow. <laughs> like really cool. Red the dunner's a guy that morphed him first. You can see he's got a he's a big or she's a big guy. Big girl. The other one we have is a citrus more. That's really cool. She was just, she was just chilling. <laughs> we had iguanas growing up. We had two. And for some reason, Iggy, one our one iguana, liked blonde hair. And if somebody yeah. blonde walked underneath their cage, he'd jump on their head. And <laughs> we tried to warn people, but it didn't always work. <laughs> Yeah, I, I just tend to stay away from the tropical ones. I like the the more the the, the heat ones, the tropical ones, and that stuff need a little bit more different style care. And iguanas can be feisty. Oh yeah, yeah. They they were they were um, they they're cute. They they they're they're a little temperamental and yeah. they hit you with their tails and it hurts. <laughs> yeah, I've heard that because they're, they're muscles, right? They're not like isn't it part of the it maybe i i'm i'm definitely not the person to ask okay. that my mom probably knows the answer but <laughs> i don't 
Hey, I just like to say, can you hear me? Am I muted? You, we can hear you. Yeah. Sure. You're muted now. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Yes. I just like to recommend to everybody if you haven't listened to all the um, Jeremy's poetry spotlight. His interview with Steve is really good. And I just realized listening to Steve's reading that having listened to that interview really helped me appreciate the Adam and Eve poems even more. So if you haven't heard that yet, check it out. Those are all wonderful. I'm just listening to the Wendy McVicker right now while I walk my dog. They're just great, Jeremy. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm glad you like the podcast. Um, Wendy, Wendy's interview was cool because she also does podcasts. So I was like, oh. <laughs> And I didn't know that, and I didn't know about her um, YouTube stuff either, which I, I wanted to tell her to post a link on OPA so I can go find it, because I couldn't find it. <laughs> so, yeah, that is neat. Yeah, yeah, she does a lot of cool stuff in the Athens, in the Athens area. Um, she had Carrie on there twice. Um, I've listened, I listened to her podcast, I listened to like the first six or seven episodes. Um, I, I have more that I need to catch up on with that too. But the the episode, Steve's episode, I put I just linked that. Do oh. listen to it. Steve, Steve gave a great yeah. <laughs> another great presentation. <laughs> I'm all over the place. Be prepared. It's gonna it's, I'm gonna take you all over the place with it. <laughs> right. It might have been your interviewer. <laughs> yeah, I probably I guarantee it was. <laughs> he kept me on he kept me on a good leash. I don't know about that. I I uh I feel like it's the other way around <laughs> a lot of the times. <laughs> no, I needed it. I wasn't complaining. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Okay, so um, let's get started. Uh, we have seven readers, so we'll go through. We'll do everybody can read twice, and then at the very end, we'll come back to and finish up with Steve. Steve will do one final poem for us, and we'll say goodnight. Okay, so up first we have Rich M followed by Kevin and then Blanche. This, this one that I, I wrote called Empty Chairs. I take one last walk after coming down the stairs, shutting each door along the way. Some rooms are full of memories and others were never filled. Either way, their doors were closed. I make my way to the front door and turn to look at the best looking space, a room filled with what's seen from the street. I step out onto the patio all alone, or so it felt. I hope I left enough behind after all the stress and grind. The head can't help but droop as I look to my left and no one is there. I can't help but think of those finished rooms, wondering if there are reasons left to push. I did the best I could and I'm so tired. I want to just sit on the swing watching others go up and down the street. Some stop and say hi for a bit, others smile and waves. Many more go on their way. Then I see a gap go, a gap go grow wide, a growing divide. I'm tired. I watch the others grow farther away, still I smile and wave. I love to find something more, thinking at the same time it's easier to say and be a bore. Wishing I had someone by my side, someone to help me organize those empty rooms, to open the doors and leave nothing to hide, a purpose, a reason, clarity, answers. A bolt. A boat pulls up, and there stands friends with open arms reaching out. I'm not re ready. I'd rather stay where I'm at. It's hard enough staying still, leaving behind with what I've made to finish out my days. I push their boat away from the porch and turn back to my spot on the swing, sitting back where I had been before with that empty spot to my left, me and my thoughts. It's easy to stop. It's easy to close my eyes to the bigger picture. The boat pulls back aside. It's time to get out and come on the porch. They did not ask, knowing I'd say no, knowing there's nothing that will change. Instead, they open the doors that have been shut for so long. They walk inside what's been empty of life. They look around at what I built. They open the doors, seeing the good. They open the doors, seeing the gloom. Still, they surprise me. They say that there's work to go. They say that you'll be ready to welcome change. They said you're loved. They said you're human. I wanted to go back to my swing, forward and back, staying in the same spot. There's comfort in that. They'll go away soon. They'll go about their lives and move on. Instead, they pull up the chairs and sit down. They will not always sit in those chairs. They have their own path. But those chairs are not meant to keep us in place. They are a place to rest, a place to gather. I take a glance at the broken anchor floating away. It seems so far. It seems so scared. The doors have been open. The light has been shown. What do I do from here? 
I do not know, and that is hard. I haven't adjusted. I'm seeking that answer. I'm looking ahead and behind the journey traveled, the past, the future, the voyage ahead. I'll need those chairs filled in days ahead. For now, mine will be empty. It's time to get to work. It's a moment to reach out. It's a chance to move forward. I take one more walk after leaving that porch, keeping each door open along the way. All right, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Rich. Uh, next up, we have Kevin, followed by Blanche and then Abby Wardlow. All right, I'm gonna start by reading uh, a poem from my most recent uh, poetry collection, uh, Do Us a Favor. Um, and I thought it would just be fitting just with all of the space news that we just got um, to read this one. So um, the title of this is, Tonight is the Night to Look at the Sky. Uh, tonight is the night to look at the sky, find targets. Meteors zip into deepest black, act as laser pointers. I want to pounce on them. I never catch them in time. A new life appears. Soon it's gone out of existence. Much like mayflies along the lake rest on white walls of houses one morning, then crunched underfoot in the darkness later that evening. I shake more when I sit still. Breath pours out onto polished surfaces. My whole self wipes blank during the endless winter months. When Beetlejuice explodes in the sky, it will have already been gone for ages. I am under covers, embroidered, eyes wide open, seeing nothing and everything all at once. Matter in front of me morphs into flickering flame, touching my tongue so I can say what no one understands. Another language whispers goodnight in this not so distant space. Warmth spreads through my veins. Comets are not ice any longer, but indestructible fire. Thank you. Beautiful, wonderful, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, next up, and, and it's just a, a word of to, to everybody, if you have a book and you want to plug it, go ahead, put it in the chat, let people know. Um, next up is Blanche, followed by Abby and then Doc Janning. Hello, everyone. Good evening from Cincinnati, Ohio. Steve, I so enjoyed your poems. Oh, my goodness. Uh, the basement. Oh, my God. <laughs> it totally blew me away. I was like, I need to write that down. I love my basement. Thank you so much. Thank you. I wrote, uh, we get to read one or two. We're just reading one, two. We're going to read. We're going to read two. Okay, good. So I wrote this poem because I, I think poems should always evoke some kind of emotion. Let's see if you get what emotion I was going for. I call this for all I know. <clears throat> A few of my cousins were born with six fingers, one extra hanging off the side of the pinky finger. Like the tentacles of an octopus making the miracle of a newborn a carnival-like apparition which fell off sometime before time to crawl, before others could cower, could gape, ogle, and leer, about those piano advantage mysteries, which, thank God, did ripen, did one day bud forth, promise to normalcy. And what, might you ask, did it all mean, these dangling participles, these mixed metaphors, perhaps the same as baby wizards break dancing fire into snow, and this parable is just that, for all I know. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, so I could read another one now or later. When do later. I? Okay, we'll save that to later. Thank you guys for listening. Absolutely. All right. Um, next up, we have Abby Wardlow, followed by Doc and then Tom. Hi, let me see if I can actually get my camera to work. That would be awesome. <laughs> hey, there we go. Hi. <laughs> uh, so recently, Jeremy's kind of sent me on this uh, 20 poem for two weeks long quest. And this is one of the ones that I wrote very recently that I was quite proud of from last week. And it's called um, Ode to My Favorite Skirt. 
I pull up my brown pleated mini skirt, cotton and corduroy tracing up the skin of my leg, resting just above my hips. My mother works my waist, fingering a loose thread, the thin and stringy gray ribbons pulled out of her face. The fabric of her hands, cracks of canyons filled with salt water, eroded by disinfectant and warm water. I hear the zzz of the zipper in the fluorescent lights. Familiar eyes, artificial yellow, not of the sun. A specter in her scrubs and laceless sketchers, the stubborn wrinkles that just won't iron out, bonds of fibers with fading elasticity bent into new crevices, each fight broken, chart written, and pill given. One hour of a 12 hour shift on the tag, all for a skirt. Zipping it shut, a switch for good measure, and my fingertips fall perfectly at the hem. Thank you. Wonderful. Excellent. All right, Doc, you are next. Okay. <clears throat> this is titled Magic, spelled M A G I C K. Touched by the fires of time, infused with elements of eternity, ascend into sacred spaces surrounded by love. Soar on wings of infinite peace among all the mysteries of existence on the other side of silence into gathering shades and colors of you. Musics of the multiverse flow eons long over, around, under, and through you amid whispers and tapestries of life. Soliloquies of forever and all the unknown tomorrows resonate within yourself. Magic of imagination guides your journey to the far side of the stars, into the spectrum of memory and the infinite intimacy of bliss. And you, dreaming, drifting, become. Thank you. Thank you, Doc. Excellent. Wonderful. All right, next up we have Tom Barlow, followed by Anushka, and then myself, and then we'll go back to the beginning. Thanks, Jeremy. I, um, I was, I've written a poem. I, I mean, you're familiar, I'm sure, with the um, Grant Wood painting, American Gothic. I got to th looking at that and thinking, this is so outdated. Um, it needs to reflect something about today. So I wrote this poem, American Gothic, after Grant Wood. She sits in her Adirondack chair on the front porch of a summer afternoon, overlooking a cutting garden in her Confederate flag t-shirt, knitting shotgun shells with an old pair of ramrods. Her 12 gauge is propped against the banister next to an old hound yipping in its sleep. And on the side table, a tea service holds black powder in the china pot, buckshot in the cup. In the barn, he practices his thrusts and parries using the pitchfork with tines sharpened to needle points. His camo t-shirt offers no place to grip in hand-to-hand -hand combat. The same for his shaved head. He tries not to gag on the tobacco chaw, spitting the juice just as he would into the eyes of an attacker as he buries the fork chest high into the king post before rejoining her on the porch. Together they sip their Red Bulls and wait for the artist to come by and paint them again. Thank you. Wonderful, excellent. All right, thank you very much, Tom. Next up we have Dushka. Thank you so much everybody for having me. I appreciate each and every one of you. I apologize, my phone is talking. But, <laughs> so I wrote a piece and I'm actually, um, coming up with a poetry collection right now. And the whole theme is for the passionate refined woman. So I wanna read a piece called Fire Woman actually. So it goes like this. Save the day, why don't you? Goblins of dimness don't stand a chance around you. Superwoman, supernatural in every way, adorned with capes of fiery heroism. The heroic acts of your blaze are a sight for all to see. Your arsenal equipped with the fuel of love to light the way. Fear cowers at the mere flicker of your power. Superwoman, supernatural in every way. Light the night, why don't you? Light the day. 
Thank you. Beautiful, that's gorgeous. Thank you. <laughs> All right, thank you, so, thank you so much for sharing, Nushka. All right, I'm gonna read and then we'll go back up to Rich and Kevin. Okay, that's a little weirder. Um, it's called Driving Into Daisies. <clears throat> This is where I drive, straddling the shoulder line, my head out the window, away from the plastic and steel, gnawing at the pavement to my left. What's left? Left to chance. Chance is why I eat cereal in third shift and facelift dry call for help memes and manicure my nailed beds. Nails don't pierce rubber when driving into daisies. It's not about what you've gone and did, but DID is really rare, unrealistically rare. Sybil made everyone crazy. Or perhaps some folk learn the sun shined for the very first time, and we think about these things while driving around curves and wondering how fast groceries go bad. A calculus that changes throughout the year. Flowers and flowing fescue and their various grotesque entrails are strewn about the surface upon which we eat or above our bedsides, their corpses jammed together in vases, the stench of their decay lifting our spirits. So, happy romance day. Let us pour the bubbly and remember it's time to drive into daisies, leave the driveway's narrow line and peel out upon the flower bed, spit dirt across the field and make, field and make up a different reason to every person who asks what that giant hole in your yard is and where it came from, just to amu amuse yourself. Make it not even worth lying about, Force yourself to plant something new. New is grotesque, but it's a sign you're still moving forward. All right, uh, next up we have Rich and then Kevin and then uh, we'll, back to Blanche. All right, this one I called Tales of a Bard. And when I wrote it, it should have remembered that bards often tell of what has been and not what is. It's a good poem, I think. The nights apart seemed so hard, even as I lay here writing the tale of a bard. The songs were long, even still the crowd followed along. They sat there raptured as they heard the tale of how my heart was captured. The tale was winding, but the joy told was spellbinding. They couldn't help but rejoice as I told the tale in a wondrous voice. Their joy couldn't be contained when the depths of it all was explained. For there are loves that are ordinary, then there's one found in the library. Those tales of romance where it's love at first glance, there's something to be said for those words that must be read. The classic tales of timeless love, which must be told of. Some people must dust off those pages, while others must read tales of the ages. Those books that one keep, can keep reading, but still always know where they're leading. I must count myself the luckiest, po luckiest poet around, or am I just spellbound? Either way, I don't care, because there is love, no love that can compare. Each day I get to write the next page of the greatest love known to this age. Each day I get to put pen to paper to an amazing heart's caper. Each day I get to share the answer to the most wonderful prayer. Wonderful. All right. Thank you so much for sharing, Rich. Next up we have Rich, or I'm sorry, Kevin. <laughs> Then Blanche. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, I'm going to, I've never read this poem before um, in any reading. So, um, so I don't know if anyone's heard of the Ghost City Press summer chapbook series, mini chapbook series, but uh, uh, I have something coming out August 1st with them, um, which is super exciting. And I thought I'd uh, read the poem's namesake uh, with you all today. Um, so it should be kind of fun. <laughs> um, the title is you thought this was just going to be about Cleveland, didn't you? This is the year. It's going to be the year. We will win it all again. The ships on the Cuyahoga, there they are. And here, a giant sign that reads, this is the name of our city. Better in cursive script so people can't decipher the true meaning, even now, penned out for pilots. Who's ever felt an ice sheet of nostalgia? Maybe back in the 90s when everything floated like the dead, fish on the surface during a riverboat cruise late spring, fourth grade. Who learned about the underbelly more than they thought they should? It's always a point and click summer, even before it became a term one used when ideas felt felt. When the briefest moment swelled like clouds before the biggest storm bent every single tree backward. I didn't know what this river divided. Truths most people don't want to admit. 
People have to hear the sirens coming, the hints at the corners. Just burn what you don't like, they say. Seems to be a commonplace statement now. At the edges of screens, pick the scars, tear pages, embrace the green surface of the lake. Soon, all that will be left are surfboards in December. Excellent, wonderful. All right, next up we have Blanche, followed by Abby and then Doc. Hey, let's see. Regarding Michiko for Jack Gilbert, she sat focused there all alone of one a person trying to feel that all was too fateful, that what her smile predisposed more than love took away as she fell all back mighty, smiling once for all sections to see, taking all but one looking around about her breast as she walked first above, foremost when digits started to stir and what took continuous weightless means again, foremost she pretended for all her memory before the lead stirred on from the pits that was pushed on to protrude the site where the wrist laid tight but now the one must stop formally before, so that now she must ride for former time tasting the means of the wild all the way through to the end, to her ending. Thank you. Excellent, such wonderful work tonight. This is awesome. <laughs> all right, next up is Abby Wardlow, followed by Doc Janning and then Tom Barlow. Hello, so this one is just called Visiting My Dad. A uh, throbbing, like 10 extra hearts stuffed in my fingertips, dipped into the plastic mug of ice. I only focus on his eyes, the whites of black stained bloodied teeth brought tears to mine, choking my words like his breathing tube, his thumb potato sack burlap scratching against mine. Thank you. <laughs> hey, wonderful. Okay, Doc, you are up. followed by Tom, then Nushka. Okay. Chrysalis of time opens, revealing past, present, and future. Kaleidoscopic wings of before today and beyond tomorrow. Pathways of the past converge, becoming today. Trails to the future diverge into infinite futures. Its starry children whisper silent songs of forever and fractal life revels in love of itself. Its sacred fires echoing through the multiverse, a journey of unknowns resonating to become limitless possibilities. Thank you. Excellent, Doc throwing it down. Okay, so now we have Tom. Tom Barlow followed by Nushka. Thanks, Jeremy. You know, I've been reading Diana Seuss's Pand um, Pulitzer Prize winning book of sonnets. I've got, it occurred, seemed to me, it brought to mind that so many of the poets that I really enjoy that bring wildness to their poetry are women and kind of inspired this poem called Pandemonium. Night after night, I danced on dynamite wrote the poet I.E. Words I ponder while Joni Mitchell blazes through some Mingus. And I wish sometimes I could be one of those women who write with black powder, wear, an, wear a time signature or a key change or a verb could explode at any moment. It is their pandemonium that blows the doors open to free the dragon. And we trembling acolytes try to stand our ground this time, hoping to see into the fire as they do, if that's what it takes to burn the house down. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you, Tom. Um, all right, next up is Nushka, followed by myself, and then Steve will bring us home. 
Thank you again for the opportunity. I appreciate each and every one of you. So this piece right here is called Crackling Pops. Awakened by the crackling pops of the fire I set last night, victory dance to the fire, victory dance to the pops. A melodious rhythm, a sound for all to hear. All rebels to my goodness were burned up in the fire that blazed through the night, leaving a canister empty and nothing but refinement behind. A refinement so pure, shining brighter than the highest carrots of gold. Victory dance to the fire, victory dance to the pops. It was the purity for me. The eyes within that twinkled on out as I danced to my reflection, intimately, lovingly, passionately. It was the fire for me. Victory dance for the fire, victory dance to the pipes. Beautiful. Thank you so much for sharing. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Um, I have a poem here. Uh, this one is about uh this one is about Alzheimer's. Um it's it's a little stream of consciousness, so I apologize for that in advance. Um it's oh, where did I where did I put it? This is it. This is it. Okay. Um, this is called uh, <clears throat> Alzheimer's Part Two. I cannot find where my grandmother is. She's walking beneath the end of the fender that sounds like an alarm. Sergeant Pepper and G.I. Joe making their demands, adjusting their overalls and wearing their PTs and doing their push-ups and demanding well more that is well and above a thing they could see because there is a yellow flower. And there's something underneath that flower bed. I don't think I wanted to write about flowers and I never understood people who did write about flowers, but now here I am writing about flowers. There is something underneath my girdle and it girds me to understand understand the limitation of where I end and the green mossy substance underneath where my mattress ends. And this is where the mattress ends. This is where I sit and I think about the ends of mattresses and I'm quickly brought to the end of life and the complete and total extinguishment that is a blown out candle late for its rent payment, shut off from all the kinetic energy accounts and the kind of explosive energy that tells us it's not possible to have combustion without finding a solution that is rooted in other things I can't find a way to tell. I can't tell that to someone who hasn't raised cow before, hasn't raised cows before. How heavy were the cows when they were lifted up onto cranes and sold out for their beef and what they were and are? Because there is no cow level. There is no place beyond the fence, outside or within, that is willing to withstand that particular packing, if you get my drift. And well, if this isn't the final eclipse of winter, it's sure as hell the autumn. Thank you. All right. So, Steve, it's all you. Okay. Thank you. Um, Jeremy, thanks for having me again. I appreciate it quite a bit. Um, thank you to all the flamingos who showed up tonight. It's been awesome mingling with you. Um, this poem that I'm going to be finishing with is from the wild gospel of careening and a little background. Um, when I first started reading out, um, I didn't pace myself very well. Um, I would read 17 poems in under five minutes. My first feature went very quickly. Um, I've learned to moderate my pacing a, a lot more than I had, um, but this poem kind of uh, makes me want to get out in front of myself again. And one of me, one of my friends had asked me, and had talked to me about well, why I read so fast. And to me, it was my natural speaking rhythm. So it didn't seem fast to me. Um, so I asked him to listen faster. So um, I'm asking you all to listen faster for this last poem. Thank you. Green become green become blue. You can hear the television and I become the dialogue. I become the words and the music and the nodding head. I become the time between the remote control falling from your hand and its diagonal crash upon the carpet. I become carbonated breaths and candied eyes. I become John Dillinger dancing like Fred Astaire. I become sex. I become all of the eyes that have ever cried over you. I become all of the skies that have ever blued over you. I become a river of violet, a river of violins, a river of violence. 
I become green, become green, become green, become blue. I become poppies and daffodils and lilies and fingers and legs and elbows and an ill-informed nation of carnations that listen to too much talk radio and use books as doorstops. I become thought bubbles and submarines and screen doors and silver scented salamanders. I become Fred Astaire dancing like Salome, toes digging into the still warm body of John the Baptist. I become the blinking digital clock and the loudest alarm. I become the, sum I become the sound of your mother's voice when you thought you'd forgotten it. Thank you. Excellent. Oh man. This, everyone, thank you so very much for attending tonight. It was a wonderful reading. Special thank you to Steve Brightman who really just, just tore up tonight. Everybody, your, your poems were wonderful. I'd love to see you back again. Sorry, what, let's go ahead. <laughs> yeah, round of applause. Yeah, round of applause. <laughs> for everybody. Woo, everybody, you're right, Steve. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I have, if you are interested, we have, this is the event for next month, so you can feel free to register. Next month, we are having Nick Gorgio. He is a fiction writer. Um, he has done collaborations with poets before. He's, a, he's, a, he's an excellent reader, um, and I, I really like his writing. It's, I don't know how to describe it other than succinct and very millennial but it's very it's very good um this is the link to our facebook group feel free to check us out and uh this is do, 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 do. this final link is to our website so check us out um, on the website you can sign up for our newsletter we send out a newsletter every two weeks um so you know keep up to date we have a mix of in-person events in parma and we have events that we do online um in august we have a uh, script writing workshop with jason half who's uh he's a playwright from uh, athens ohio um so yeah but i want to thank everyone for being here tonight it was wonderful um keep in touch you know reach out if you need anything and thank you for the great reading thank you bye everybody <laughs>